I'm going to talk to you folks about how, if you want to transition to organic, what that timeline looks like, what the process looks like. This is not specific to just organ tilth. This is probably going to be similar to like ISDA, for example, in the large sense, and to most of the uh, 70 accredited certifiers in the United States. Okay. Now, the very first place to start is who are the actors here? There's kind of three major groups. There's the USDA NOP. I don't have NOP up there, but that's the National Organic Program. So back in 2001, I believe it was, uh, the USDA said, hey, all these folks are out there certifying. We want to kind of get them on the same track because otherwise one certifier could be holding people to a whole set of standards that was about 180 from what another certifier was doing, and that wouldn't do consumers very much good. Um, so the USDA said, we're going to set the baseline and ensure that these certifiers are all certifying to that organic baseline. A common misconception is that the USDA themselves certify entities. That's not true. You get their stamp on your product that says USDA organic. You get to use the O word organic on your product, and you can use the C word certified by Oregon Tilt or ISDA. You cannot uh, necessarily use those words without getting in quite a bit of trouble sometimes unless you're certified. There are exceptions, and I can talk about the $5,000 exemption a little later. Some of you are already familiar with it. But that's, that's the USDA. Then there's the certifiers. I said there's about 70 of them that are accredited by the USDA. So the certifiers like Oregon Tilth inspect farmers, processors, and that sort of thing. The USDA is the one that inspects us and making sure we're doing our job. And then there's the organic inspectors themselves who are individuals, third parties, uh, or maybe they work specifically for a certifier. They're either on contract or they're a staff member of a certifier. And they are the ones you're familiar with that go out to the farm and actually have a look around and talk to you about borders and buffers and how you're treating your livestock and all these sorts of things. Again, a common misconception, and it's totally fair misconception, is that the organic certifier, just that one person, is the auditor that's granting certification or not. No, that's actually the certification agencies like TILF or OCIA that are granting certification, giving you a certificate. I do want to say, folks, that the certifiers are definitely not there to police you or to pass fail you on certification. They are there as your advocates to help you wade through all the red tape that is USDA government language. And I will a little later here, uh, maybe show a sample or you can have a look at uh, kind of that stuff and you see why there's some value in having certifiers who are trained in looking through this language and these regulations and helping you sort through it, applying them to your farm in order to be certified organic and uh, compliant with USDA standards. I'll have a quick look, no questions so far, so we'll keep moving forward. All right, folks, this is a nice graphic to start with. So if I am considering becoming certified organic, a lot of you have heard it takes three years. That's not necessarily always the case, but it must be three years from the point of a prohibited substance application to your land or to your crops before you can become uh, fully certified. So let's, for sake of arguments, take April 18th of 2018. If you know that someone in spring did a knockdown herbicide, not totally atypical, on the land that you're farming, whether you purchased it or whether you've owned it and you were the one that applied it or contracted someone to, you could not be fully certified, have a certificate in hand until April 18th of 2021. Along that path then is when you wanna be thinking about certification. So some of you today are definitely in that boat, I would think. You'd say, well, I know two years ago, someone sp sprayed glyphosate on my land or I sprayed glyphosate on my land. So that area of the land, that had that glyphosate application would not be eligible uh, if it was two years ago for another year. I think the key thing to know is that you're going to want to apply before your eligibility date. So if we sprayed back in April 18th of 2018 and then April 18th, 2021, we could be eligible. You could apply somewhere eight to 12 weeks before that date, have a certificate in hand. Now, the other thing is a lot of people say, well, do I get to sell as organic for a crop that I harvested in 2020 if I become organic and have a certificate? No, it has to be inspected. They have to have an organic inspector out there inspect the crop 
before harvest in order for that crop to be certified organic and to be sold as organic under your certificate. So those are some really key guidelines. I'd encourage you if that's uh, a little mixed up to ask questions, but I can assure you that this timeline is going to come up a little later and we'll circle back around to it. Right. Let's keep moving forward here, folks. So the first place to start is becoming familiar with the standards that the USDA is setting forth for organic farmers, for processors, and uh, even people doing wild harvest, because we have folks that are maybe going out and harvesting ginseng or something like that. We certify operations that are harvesting sea kelp in Alaska. So the, the reach of organic products and what we can certify is quite large. Maybe uh, some of you here today are doing livestock. We certainly can certify livestock and have very clear standards of living and healthcare and that sort of thing, feed for those livestock. So we wanna, before we jump into it, uh, become familiar with those so we know how to start farming organically. Now this is the NOPs, organic standards. If you want to put yourself to sleep, you can go on the electronic code of federal regulations, ECFR, and you can look through all the subtitles and the sub chapters, which is what uh, the folks at TILF are paid to do. and. Uh, not a penny too less, to wade through that stuff and dis distill that information to farmers. This is what our staff is very, very, very good at. Uh, and we even have to write internal policies and uh, sort of guidelines based on these. So that's where certifiers do differ a little because we are interpreting rulings. And then we take that to the USDA and ensure that we're interpreting the rulings correctly. Real quick folks, I should pause because Christina threw out a quick question. Do we know of any native plant nurseries that are certified organic? I, off the top of my head, can think of one, yes. So I can tell you there's absolutely one. I can bet my buttons there's a whole lot more than that, okay? So yes, I can show you a tool before the end of today where you can search that sort of thing because maybe you have a crop that's unusual or a business model that's unusual and you say, oh, well, can you even certify that as organic? Can aquaponics be certified organic? Hydroponics, that comes up all the time. So I'll show you a database, remind me to do that if I forget, uh, that you can search organic entities. So you know, well, at least there's someone else doing it certified that gives me hope that I can. Okay, back to what we're saying here on the standards. If you search very simply in Google for guide for organic crop producers, as you see on my right there, the USDA organic guide for organic crop producers, that is a much friendlier guide than the one on my left. And it's well, something prepared by the USDA for this is the kind of stuff you have to look at for managing pests and disease for your seeds and planting stuff. So it's basically all the legalistic language on the left it distilled into 64 pages of the things that are um, a lot easier to digest. All right. Going forward, though, we have a tool on our website. So you could go to Oregon Tilth, tilth.org. And you could look for our transition guide as you're becoming organic yourself. That's like a, oh, I think 14, 16 page document. So if you're not into reading 64 pages, maybe you don't have time, uh, attention span like myself always, you can uh, start with this quick start guide that Oregon Tilt prepared. That's basically the uh, guide I showed earlier here for organic crop producers broken down to about a quarter of the length. So I'd encourage you to check that out if you have a chance. All right, folks, let's keep moving forward. Once you're somewhat familiar with those standards, and by the way, certifiers like ISDA, Oregon Tilth, uh, I mean, OFA back in Ohio, wherever you are, certifiers are really glad to help you upfront navigate some of those standards. So you don't necessarily have to uh, start reading through it and say, whoa, I, what does this mean? I give up. Please don't ever hit that roadblock. We're there to help. You can definitely get a hold of myself at Tilth. I did have my uh, contact there. I'll show my contact again later. We have a whole team of folks that are glad to help you kind of interpret what that is uh, asking for. So don't let that get in your way. All right, moving forward. If you say, I definitely want to go through with this. I have some familiarity with the standards and you know what, I can pull this off. How am I going to convert my land? So here's some real simple, I'll just show you three because that's you can break it down to that easy three very simple conversion strategies of how you might put your acreage or your herds if, or flocks into organic. The first would be the one shown here, which is gradual. So that's saying I'm taking maybe a quarter of my acreage, 
and moving it into organic one field at a time. And then there's a field ahead of it that's transitional. So this O field is eligible right now in 2021. That T field is going to be eligible in 2018, 2019. And I'm keeping careful records on what I'm doing to that field in the meantime. And those C fields, we still are spraying them. We have an outbreak of knotweed or pick something uh, horrible like that. Uh, and so we're still trying to get on top of that knotweed. We have to spray it, we feel. Um, and we're just not ready to convert those to organic. That's just fine. Another common misconception people have is that, well, if I'm spraying even a quarter of my property that I can't be organic. We've had people call us that have thousands of acres back in the Midwest and they say, well, I just round up around my house and you know, so spray the sidewalk. So I don't think I'm eligible. Not for a second. We have a lot of people who are certified organic and they decide to use a little glyphosate around their house. That's not getting on the food crops that are going to consumers. That's not our concern. As long as that is, you know, a reasonable distance away from the crops and there's no risk of contamination, then that's not going to be concerned. It's something your inspector will ask you about. They may see a backpack sprayer and a jug of glyphosate in the shed. They're not going to uh, give you a scowl or a bad look. They're just going to say, oh, I noticed you have this. What's that used for? You can say I spray around my sidewalks so it doesn't get full of weeds. And that's it. I spray with a backpack sprayer on a cool day or in the morning when it's not windy and my crops are 100 feet away. No concerns there. Okay. Don't see any questions yet. Moving on. Another form of converting is to actually do a split strategy where you're basically managing some of your land is organic and some is conventional. Um, it's pretty similar to the one we just looked at, but it's saying, well, yeah, again, those fields full of knotweed, I just can't get them to organic yet. So I'm going to keep uh, manage them conventionally until I get on top of it. But these other fields I've gotten on top of the knotweed and I'm able to manage them without uh, burn down herbicides or whatever it might be. So um, I'm going to manage them as organic. We have tons of producers who do this and for a multitude of reasons, they'll do it. I would encourage you, you know, um, it, well, we'll get to the cost. I'll just say it right now. It doesn't cost any more really to certify a hundred acres that you have as it does 10. It might take the inspector a little longer to go across your extra acreage. So maybe your inspection cost is a little bit higher, but we're talking, you know, 10, 20, 30 bucks or a hundred bucks or something to get that extra acreage. So at least Oregon Till does not charge per acre. Check with your certifier though. It's possible there's some certifiers that do charge per acre, but at least for Oregon Till, we don't charge by that. So, um, you know, it behooves you perhaps to, if the land is eligible, include in certification, even if it's not just a crop you have any market for as organic, because who knows in the future that may be a viable uh, alternative or a market for you. All right, that was a bit of a tangent, but this one caution, if you are doing split operation, if I am growing pumpkins organically on organic land and I'm growing pumpkins conventionally uh, on my same acreage as a split operation, you have to keep very clear records because the concern would be that, oh, I harvested some pumpkins from the conventional, but I, they got on the wrong truck. Now they're mixed in with the organic. That's gonna be a real issue. So it's possible to do this. We have plenty of people do, but they have very clear systems of this is the harvest date for the pumpkins that were organic. It came before the ones that were conventional and we got them packed, loaded and sold, or some system where we know they go in the blue trucks and not the red trucks, just some system in place to ensure you're not contaminating or co-mingling your organic product with your conventional if you're doing split and it's the same crop. All right. The simplest one for conversion is just, I'm going to convert all my land at once. It's eligible, or at least the parts of my land that are eligible, and I'm going to only grow organic. I can tell you folks firsthand that this makes life a lot easier in terms of uh, preventing that co-mingling that we just talked about with the pumpkin example, because anything coming off that farm is going to be certified organic, whether it's hay, silage, uh, chicken, eggs, you know, whatever it is, you're not worried about keeping separate your organic products and your conventional products. All right, quick coffee break here. Now, with all that said, I wanna jump into record keeping because for me, as an organic producer, when I first started, uh, I learned quickly that 
about 90% of being certified organic is record keeping. Now that's kind of a generalization. Maybe that's not exactly what it takes, but it at least tells you the importance of record keeping in certified organic operations. Uh, I cannot understate how important it is to keep good records that are auditable. And this is often the biggest challenge for producers who are new because uh, I've heard a survey that two thirds of farms, not organic or conventional, just two thirds of farms don't really keep any records other than what's in the farmer's head at the time. Uh, I myself was certainly guilty of that for years. I saw my own uh, farm blossom in ways because I was keeping good records for organics. I was also, I knew when I irrigated, knew when I fertilized, knew when I weeded. And uh, for anyone that's a good practice, but as we all know, it's really easy to kind of let that go by the wayside when there's it's a busy season and you say, well, I'll remember that stuff. I don't know about you folks, but I can't really trust my memory as well as I used to. So anyway, let's jump into record keeping here. Our uh, NLP National Organic Program regulations require that we keep records that are, here's the quote, adapted to the operation. They keep them on hand, disclose all the activities and transactions that they're doing, meaning purchase and sales records, and you keep them around for five years. You're maintaining them for five years and they're sufficient to demonstrate compliance. That's a mouthful, but it's basically saying, um, you've got to have those records in a place that they're accessible for five years. For records, you can keep them in whatever format you want, okay? So you can keep them uh, in spiral notebooks. You can keep them on a napkin if you want. You can keep them in highly complicated Excel spreadsheets. Your consultant can keep them in their workbook, but make sure if that consultant leaves the farm, if you uh, no longer hire them, that you get those records because the day that you suddenly don't have uh, access to something from four years ago is the day that you may get a non-compliance for record keeping. It can create a real issue. The only records folks that are not auditable really are records that are in your head, uh, which unfortunately a lot of us keep them up there. So we can't audit what's in your head. We can audit it even if it's written on a barn wall. And I'll tell you real quickly that we've literally had a, a producer who was writing vaccination records for calves on the barn wall in a Sharpie. And that was fine until someone in the family decided to paint in the barn and paint it over those records. So you may want, you may want to consider your record keeping practices and ensure that it's something that's going to be available to the inspector, auditable at all times, and it's in a safe place. If it's in a spiral notebook, keep it in a safe place in the house or have a backup somewhere. If it's in an Excel file, you'll want to create a backup on Google Docs or whatever you use, but just have backups of those records because they're precious to you in uh, organic certification and necessary for compliance. So that paper trail shows us that these folks have been compliant all this time. Just to give you a real quick examples of uh, some record keeping for farms. So I'll move this through this sort of uh, straightforward. I don't want to go discuss these at great length in the interest of time, but you're looking at things like, hey, here's where I purchased my seed from. Uh, here's an invoice for what I bought exactly from Johnny's seeds, how much I bought, whether or not it was organic, that sort of thing. So keep those invoices field activities. So what am I doing out in the field? Am I uh, going out to disc at this time of year? You're going to want to have some record of uh, anything you've done out in the field. You don't necessarily have to keep perfect records of every time you irrigate and how much. It certainly is a feather in your cap if you do, but you're not going to fail certification if you don't necessarily have, um, well, we went and ho hoed for a couple hours this day, okay? But major operations in the field like harvest and that sort of thing are important. I'll stop and say, is the certification process the same on tribal lands? Thanks for that question. I appreciate it. So is the certification process the same on tribal lands? I mean, it's a great question. We don't often get that. Absolutely, it's the same in terms of the USDA's requirements. However, the certifier, the auditor, in other words, the inspector that's going in there, needs to comply with uh, any tribal rulings, regulations, norms, uh, customs that are um, being upheld on that land. So it's going to be a little different. Uh, I can't give you a great example off the top of my head. I haven't been on one of those inspections before, but we certainly uh, inspect operations on tribal lands. And so I'm just saying they're beholden to a few more uh, standards there, but the baseline is still the same. I hope that uh, answered it okay. If not, let me know. 
All right, further record keeping. Equipment cleanout logs is a big one. I have uh, maybe uh, a rototiller and want to be sure that I show that it was, uh, I borrowed it from the neighbor. I want to be sure that I showed that uh, I sprayed it off with a pressure washer and removed any soil or crop particulate that was on that, uh, that piece of equipment because maybe my neighbor wasn't certified organic. Or if they are, I want to copy their organic certificate. So I know that I'm not bringing soil or crop matter over to my land that is perhaps contaminated. And here's a bunch of the other ones. Harvest production records, like how much did I grow? Uh, how, when did I harvest? Because they're going to look at the, um, the team at Tilth and the inspector are going to look at, does it make sense how much I am selling with how much I grew? If I have one acre, but I'm selling, you know, thousands and thousands of units of, uh, or bushels of apples or something like that, and it doesn't make sense with the amount of land that I have, it would lead one to believe that perhaps I'm wholesaling and buying conventional apples and because I have an organic certificate reselling them. This is extremely rare that that ever happens. The wonderful thing is that most organic producers are honest and have uh, uphold integrity, but that's the reason that we keep these records is to ensure uh, it protects us, it protects the consumers. So you want to keep those records and make sure the amount you're selling makes uh, sense with the amount of land you have and the amount of seed you're bringing and all those sorts of things. And then with animal health, uh, we want to see when they're grazing, when they're on the pasture, and when they're being confined. Uh, in other words, in the barn, uh, what their animal health looks like, records of, you know, uh, I'm taking time to go out and look at my herd and see if I have a calf that's kind of droopy or something like that, maybe has coccidiosis, that you're uh, always attentive to the health of your animals and taking measures uh, to prevent them from getting sick. And then, of course, feed purchases. Where is your livestock feed coming from is a huge one because it's got to be certified organic. How much are they uh, consuming? Does it make sense with uh, the herd size that I have? All right, and sales records are a big one. We just want to know uh, how much is going out the door. We don't need to know what your margins are necessarily, but we do need to know what you're selling and make sure, again, that it makes sense with uh, what you're raising in terms of animals or crops. I'll, I'll glaze over this one because this is more for processors, but it still is worth seeing. So these are the sort of thing processors are looking at, very similar to farms in a way. Everything that I'm bringing in on here and how I'm cleaning my processing plan out, um, where my product is stored if I'm making granola bars, where these granola bars are stored, what inventory do I have, uh, how it's being treated in the warehouses, that sort of thing. So all of this comes back to how much am I producing and what's going out the door? Real simple folks, uh, we'd love to see at an inspection that you have spiral ring bound records. That makes it really easy in case the power or the internet go out. So if you have that and the inspector can look through that when they're out on inspection. Now I know things are a little different with COVID right now. So we are doing some more remote inspections, but you know, uh, it looks like COVID will end here soon enough. And so uh, we will go back to the day where we're doing more in-person inspections and we'll have uh, opportunity to look through records. This is a great way to do it. You have some hard copies on hand. And if you're doing organic management and conventional split production, you have them separated so the inspector can look at both and make sure they both make sense. Okay, just look at the time here. I wanna be fair with time. Um, I'm gonna move fairly straightforward here. Please let me know, uh, gals, if uh, there's any concern, but uh, we're getting down to it here. So use the technology for record keeping that is appropriate for your farm. They don't mandate that you use anything fancy. They, um, you don't have to use Excel. You can use a calendar, right? On, is on here, this Purina calendar and just write records right on that. That's just fine. So use what's appropriate for your farm that you're familiar with. Don't feel like you have to go purchase or buy anything fancy or new. And believe me, some people will try to sell it to you when they find out you're organic through whatever means uh, you'll start seeing Google ads and all that stuff. You do what's good for you. All right. Um, this is just a very simple mapping tool that's by the NRCS, the Soil Mapping Survey. So this is a great way to make a map of your farm, which is a requirement in certified organic. Here's a hand-drawn map, a very nicely hand-drawn map where a farmer has parcels. They've named their parcels. They know they're growing carrots in 17.3 and they've got alfalfa over in 17.5 and they're rotating throughout there. So this is a map we'll keep on hand. This allows the inspector to know where to go to and where to expect the boundaries to be. 
where the buffers are. This is a great map because they show that there's a tree line between there and the neighbors to prevent some overspray, that sort of thing. All right, I'm gonna finish your folks with uh, inputs fairly quickly, just to respect time. And I'm not seeing any other questions come through. This is a big one. Along this transition, if you're transitioning to organic, we don't need to know anything before that uh, application of a prohibited substance on April 18th. So anything that happened before then, like, oh, I applied 2,4-D in 2017, not a concern because April 18th is the start date. But anything from there to the point you're eligible, we need to know lime, manure, uh, compost you got from the neighbor, any application of a substance to the land over that time, keep a record of. If you say you don't know exactly when it was, but you know it was ap after April 18th, that's fine. If you say, well, I got some manure, but I don't have no idea where it came from, that's problematic. Because we can't determine for certain that that manure wasn't, I mean, spiked with, and this is unusual, but spiked with triple 16 or something to give it a real kick. Okay, weirder things do happen. So we need to confirm anything that came onto the farm and we need to confirm that it was free of prohibited substances. So for example, the best ways to go about this is either look up OMRI, which a lot of you are probably familiar with, OMRI. Uh, this is a stamp on products. You can be assured that if it's currently OMRI listed, it's allowed for use in organics. Or the WSDA, Washington State Department of Ag, actually lists organically approved amendments or inputs and tells you their use. But just be sure you're using them within the guidelines uh, approved. So if you're using rock phosphate uh, as a soil amendment, that would be different than if you're using it as um, an insecticide, for example. So be sure you're using it for the stated use and you could look it up uh, on either OMRI or WSDA. Those are both easily available online. All right. So finally, one good place to start folks, if you go on Oregon Tilt's website, you say, I'm ready to go through this. I wanna get more info, go on our website. Uh, you can search for in certification. It just says, take the first steps. We'll gather a little information about your farm. Myself or one of my team members will reach out to you and you're not committing to anything at this point. You just say, hey, I'm interested. So you can go on Oregon Till's website and find us there. If not Oregon Till, find another certifier and they'll be happy to walk you through the process, hopefully. Eva, you got a question. Um, yes. I just want to point that out. Um, so Aaron is asking, what are the business benefits to the grower of being certified organic? Are all benefits market marketing related or is there any liability protection or special access to capital or other resources? That's a that's an outstanding question, Aaron. And the best way to answer that succinctly is to say it's not just marketing or market relations based. There certainly would. I mean, liability protect, uh, protection is a whole nother ball game. Um, I can't answer that here because I'm not as familiar about, I'm, I'm not familiar with a case where a liability protection would come into play. Perhaps it exists, but I can't definitively tell you that there's one. Special access to capital, on the other hand, that's a possibility. So there's instances where an operation is certified organic and that allows them to apply for certain grants um, or like, for example, the cost share program. The cost share program, which I'll show you in a few slides, allows you to get a, a reduction in your organic fees. So these are federal programs designed specifically for certified organic operations. Um, so they do exist. That's the kind of short answer. I can't necessarily go into what all the special cases are now. There's a lot of them out there that I'm not necessarily uh, aware of. But certainly the, the forefront is, is this going to make my farm more money than the cost that I'm paying for organic? And if it's not, Am I willing to pay at a loss for organic certification just because I, for various, my values, want to have that stamp on my product? That's really the assessment you wanna make. It's an outstanding question, Aaron, thank you. Okay, briefly folks, um, organic system plan required of anyone that gets certified organic. If you apply to Oregon Tilth, you're not taking a blank sheet of paper and just writing up an organic system plan like in the old days, you know, prior to, in the 80s and 90s, that's what people did. When you apply, our application is asking all of the relevant questions that the USDA wants to know about before they can make an assessment of if you're compliant and eligible for certification. So that application becomes your organic system plan. And if you have a look at the, the one that we send you through Oregon Tilt, you have to get a hold of us first. Uh, but the one that we send you, 
will give you a really clear idea of what they're looking at for pest monitoring, for uh, fertilization of your crop, for tillage practices, that sort of thing. So that becomes your organic system plan. And you can update that as you update your practices and sort of evolve as a farm. Uh, it will ask about record keeping. And this is, like we say, a living document that changes as your farm changes. All right. I'm getting real close to the end of my part of the presentation, folks, but I uh, just want to say you submit an application to Oregon Tilth or another certifier. You have what is called initial review, where they are there to, like I said, not police it or fail you, but to check, all right, what's in compliance about these folks? Where do they need to update their practices or their labels on their products or something that's out of compliance? We get that to the point that it is fully compliant as far as we can see, and then we schedule the inspection for the auditor to come out to your site to speak with you and to look at your documents and look around the operation. They're just there to ensure that everything on your organic system plan is what you're actually doing. Very rarely do we have folks fail an inspection because unless they're doing something wildly different that they didn't mention on their initial review or their organic system plan, unless they were trying to hide something, I mean, it's very rare is when they would fail an inspection. It's common for folks to have something that's out of compliance. The inspector says, oh, well, this is not in compliance, but you, you're given a timeline or um, a plan in order to make this up and bring it to compliance. Some things need to be done immediately. Other things can be given a year or something like that. The inspector reports back to us then, and our team looks it over for a final review and makes sure, yep, the inspector the inspection report said this person's good to go. That goes pretty quick. Then you have a certificate in hand. Right now, this process takes anywhere from a, well, frankly, with COVID delays, it's about a, a three month process. Okay, in the old days, it was eight to 12 weeks, but right now it's about three months. Uh, now that you've seen this presentation, you can appreciate what goes into it. It's not just someone in an office looking over a short application. There's a very involved process to ensure organic integrity. Okay, pardon me. And like I just mentioned, because Aaron brought it up, the cost share program, anyone that pays certification fees can get up to 500, right now it's 500, a year ago it was 750 bucks. Uh, hopefully current uh, administration or USDA will bring that back up to 750 or perhaps more. There's chatter about that, but we'll see. But either way, uh, that 500 bucks goes to offset your certification fees and your inspection fees for the year. So you pay up front, but then you get it reimbursed later in the year. It's a very, very, very simple application the Farm Service Agency. Any producer I know, including myself, that has applied has gotten that reimbursement. And the more of us that do this, folks, the more money they allocate. So it has not been something that's dried up. Now, I don't know about government funding right now. It's, it's tenuous, but uh, still, uh, I do encourage anyone that's eligible to apply. All right. So I think that's a reasonable time. And I'm happy to answer any other questions here. Please do take down my email, get certified at tilth.org. That's in the bottom right there. And uh, my phone number and my team's glad to help you through. Otherwise, uh, you can look us up at tilth.org. And I'll just make a little space for questions or any comments. Great, I see Ashley put in the chat, uh, NCAP's website on resources on managing weeds and pests without pesticides. Wonderful resource there, folks, great. Yeah, Levi, this is Aaron. Um, does Oregon TILF cover more than just the state of Oregon? Does it include Washington State, uh, Idaho as well? <laughs> What's the reach? Yeah, I appreciate that, Aaron. Uh, thankfully, Oregon Tilth covers all 50 states, including Hawaii, Alaska, as well as uh, Latin America. So we most certainly cover producers in Washington and Idaho. Uh, we do have, uh, most of our producers are in the Pacific Northwest, and that's mostly what we're familiar with, but uh, we, we do cover all 50 states. Appreciate you asking. Link for organic producers, please. Yes, Isabel, thank you. So I'm gonna take a moment here. Uh, let me, and you all can still see my screen, yeah? Yes. 
Great. So this is the organic integrity database. If you search in Google organic integrity, this is the first thing that will come up. This is an immensely useful tool. Okay. You can still see this, yes? Okay. I haven't heard otherwise. So, um, so it's not in showing the, the integrity database yet, at least on my end. <laughs> yeah, thanks. You might just be sharing the PowerPoint yes, versus see. your whole desktop. Let's try this. So I'll stop share for the PowerPoint. And pardon me, folks. We'll get this one because this is really a good tool to see. And there, can we see organic integrity? Yeah. Great, yeah. thanks for bearing with me. So immensely useful tool. Uh, what I can do here is say I am interested in, oh, let's think of a crop, sorghum. And I say, oh, I wanna grow sorghum. Who else out there is doing that? This will show you everyone with sorghum on their, whether it's crop or handling certificate across the entire, not just uh, United States, but uh, it also goes somewhat worldwide. So here's people in Australia. And you say, well, I don't need to know what the Russian Federation is growing. So I say, I just wanna know, um, excuse me, growers in the United States that are doing sorghum, okay? This is giving me 918 records, holy moly. So 918 folks with sorghum on their organic certificate, whether they're crop or handling. And I say, well, I'm gonna uh, narrow it down a little more. I can do city or that sort of thing. Uh, maybe more interesting to some folks is they could do specifically Oregon tilth and they're wanting to see who's growing. Oh, let's see, apples. So these are all the people growing apples or perhaps apple products with handling that are certified by Oregon Tilth. Uh, this is, here's the, where it becomes really useful folks. I can look up Azure Farm and say, well, okay, right, they're in Dufer. Uh, that's not too far from me. Or maybe I wanna get a hold of them. I can look this up and get an idea of exactly what they're growing. You can see it's a massive certificate. Here's the useful part. I can see Rebecca is the contact for Azure Standard and uh, there's her phone number and the email and the website. So this is useful folks. If you're say um, a small swine grower, which is a bit unusual, you're growing pastured pork and you wanna connect with other people in Washington state that are growing pastured pork. So you can say, hey, where are you guys getting feed? Because I mean, organic, Growers are, tend to be really helpful to each other, frankly, it's been my personal experience. So you could get a hold of someone who is growing pork in Washington state, and you could give them a cold call, you can give them an email, say, hey, I'm just getting going, where are you getting feed? And more importantly, where are you processing your pigs at that's certified organic? Those big questions, so you don't feel so alone, because I tell you what, certifiers can't always answer these questions. So if you were to call me and you ask this, this is exactly where I'd start. I'd be glad to help you through it but this is exactly where you start when you have those sorts of questions. And if you have something really unusual you want to grow, can you say, well, are sunchokes something that I can uh, get certified? And you see right here on Azure Standard, sunchokes are something that is certifiable or sugar maples. So great tool. I'm really glad uh, Isabel asked about that. Thank you. Uh, Levi, Isabel was asking if you could bring up your first map slide that you had. Yes, I can do that, absolutely. So was that the NRCS one? Let me pull up that here. Let's see. Yes, the NRCS uh, web soil survey. Uh, some of you are probably familiar with this one. Um, let me do a screen share here. And can you all, yes, it says you can see it. Oh, there we go. So this is something I used to use when teaching soils all the time and teaching small farms and horticulture, but this is a magnificent tool. If you are wondering what kind of soil types are across your farm, this is based on soil cores taken many years uh, back 
up to today, they're still compiling it. But people took soil samples all across the United States. Some areas are more specific than others. And it gives you a soil map of your farm. So you can see that you have Willamette silt loam and it tells you the property of your soil. Um, so you can basically zoom in on an address, say I'm in the Okanagan Valley and this is my exact farm and it'll give you a soil map. It'll tell you your exact acreages and this would be a map that uh, we could accept. You'd have, still have to draw a few things on the map, like where your buffers are between you and your neighbor and what's growing there. Like if I have trees between me and my neighbor, if it's just a fence line, because that's gonna be important to mitigating spray if they're using a big boom sprayer. Anyway, those little points you'll still add, but you can hand draw those on uh, later after you print it out. So this is a great baseline. Um, you can find that by simply searching on Google and I'll let you write this down web soil survey or i think nrcs soil map might be, bring it up but web soil survey on google will definitely bring it up outstanding resource yeah great cool it's great to hear thank you Now, between now and the top of the hour, we'll turn it over to Gwen. Just walk us through what to expect when applying. All right, so hi, everybody. Let me get my screen shared. So uh, I'm the program manager for the Idaho State Department of Agriculture. And I just wanted to go quickly through our particular process, but everything Levi said is absolutely the same for Idaho as far as the process and, and what to do. So um, let me see. So just as Levi said, there are a lot of certifiers that, that can certify someone. Um, we all follow the same rules. And so I, you know, we're all overseen by the USDA to make sure that we're all doing the same things. Um, as far as us here at ISDA, we certify about 70% of the operations in Idaho. Uh, we certify a few outside of Idaho, um, just along our borders or Idaho companies with other locations. Uh, we're headquartered in Boise and we have staff around the state. So Blackfoot, Burley, and Twin Falls. Um, we have all staff inspectors and we're a small team. We're much smaller certified than or certifier than Oregon TILF. Um, so, oh, I don't know where that went. Um, so that's kind of our location. Now, maybe some of you have heard, for a while we were not accepting new applicants because we got full. Right now we do accept new producers, but we have a limited capacity. So um, what we do here is what we ask people to do is contact us and we put you on a wait list and then we'll send you an invitation to apply. So we do expect to be able to certify everyone who asks us in 2021, um, but it's something to know about us in particular is just we have a lot smaller capacity. And right now we're only accepting applications for operations in Idaho, um, but like we've mentioned, even if we're full and can't certify you, there's plenty of other certifiers. Um, there are 14 other certifiers who certify at least one operation in Idaho, um, but we're the most, and I think Oregon Tilt is the next. So that um, integrity database that you were just shown, you can also use it to search for a certifier. So under that search tab up at the top left, you can put in your state or other information and you can get the information from each of the different certifiers in that area. And that kind of helps you know at least who's already working there. Um, so one thing I, everybody wants to know is what does it cost? And so all certifiers are required to give producers an estimate. So that's a really important thing to be able to understand and to be able to shop around. So usually most of us have an application fee and an inspection fee, but really it's kind of all over the board. Even though we all follow the same certification rules, um, every certifier has a different 
fee structure. Um, and then you as certified operation, you pay that certifier for that process. So for us in particular, we have two fees, an application fee and an inspection fee. This is an example, and we have a tiered application system and it's based on gross organic sales. Um, and so, you know, really small farms, it's small and it can get up to 5,200 for the largest operations. So that's the application fee or renewal fee that's paid each year. And then our inspection fees are currently based at $35 an hour for the preparation, the inspection itself, the travel time and report writing time. And then we charge 56 cents per mile for travel to and from our office. So for us here in Idaho, this is an example of an average crop inspection cost for ISDA. I don't know about other certifiers. Um, and it totally depends. Like if you live or your farm's right outside of Boise and we have a Boise inspector going there, then your travel time and mileage would be a lot less. But, you know, this is maybe an average of someone that's kind of a little further out, um, which ends up to be around $400. So, uh, but it can really vary there. Um, so like Levi said, contact whoever it is that you wanna get interested. I definitely encourage people to shop around and find the certifier that works best for them. And um, if you're interested in ISDA, you can contact us um, by our email, organics at isda.idaho.gov, give us a call. And then we also have information on our website as well. And of course we ask that people actually contact us before they apply, just because we do have that wait list and a lot more information to give people. So that's all I have and I know I'm available for questions if you have them. Uh, Gwen, Isabel is asking if you can bring up the slide that you had with all the personnel. Yes. Thank you. Just wanted to remind everyone that Gwen definitely has the expertise to answer any questions from <laughs> anything we've heard today. So don't be shy. Sorry, I don't, I lost my presentation slide. Uh, all right, let me share my screen. Okay, so I think there you are. So this is our staff. We have myself and Nathan in the Boise office and then our inspectors. These are the ones in each of the towns. And, you know, just cause um, Ashley is based out of Black Hood doesn't mean you know, she might not go to other parts of the state to, to do inspections. And we usually send the Boise people to North Idaho, but um, this is our little group. Are the inspectors the same as certifiers? Yeah, so, well, ISDA is the certifier, um, but because we have staff, our staff, we all do everything. So we all do inspections, even me sometimes. Um, we all do initial reviews and we all do final reviews. Uh, it just you know, depends. So we, we as a group are the certifier um, and then those roles within that. But the inspectors, these are, they primarily, primarily inspect um, and then do also some of those other tasks. I'll pause for any final questions before wrapping up this session. Um, there's one more. Um, so how do you shop around for the certifiers? So what I would, I would kind of do first is probably go to that integrity database. Um, like that, and find a certifier that's operating in your state and um, and then you can click on them and you could get that information just like Levi showed, you can get uh, the contact information for farms. You could get that for certifiers and ask them for, for more information. And they can send you examples of their forms. They can send you an estimate of your costs based on more details uh, related to your operation. 
and um, you know that's probably the fastest way to go. Or if you have neighbors, you know, friends that that are certified already, you can you know ask them about their certification experience and and look around. But at least if you know an op a certifier is already working in a state, um, that might help make sure that prices are a little lower. Uh, but really, even though someone's not already working in Idaho, doesn't mean that they maybe can't do you. So um, it's just, just kind of starting to look at the resources that, that each of them have and the fees. 